in 2 Samuel, I want to uh, quote a couple of verses. I'm not done talking about what's going on uh, over in the Middle East right now. In fact, what's really interesting is that's what we're doing anyway. We're talking about what's gone on in the Middle East, right? That's why we're in 2 Samuel. We're looking back and we're aware of the kingdom. Looking at the kingdom promised to David, realized in David, but a kingdom so much bigger than David could possibly have ever expected or imagined when God said, I'm gonna build you a house, a house eternal, a kingdom eternal. And as we've talked about, we haven't even fully realized that kingdom come, his will done on earth as it is in heaven. So there is great hope out ahead of us. But I wanna read you a verse, maybe you're aware of this, maybe you're not, but Obadiah, verse 10, there's only one chapter of Obadiah, so it's the 10th verse of Obadiah says, because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. And the word violence is Hamas. So I believe that that verse is specifically prophetic. Even in terms of because of violence to your brother Jacob, well, you know, that's the truth. Whether Arab or Jewish, they are Semitic, Shemitic people of the line of Shem, the son of Noah. And it is remarkable that when we see the kind of violence that has taken place in Israel, it's by relatives. I know that's crazy even to think of that. But because of violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever. Again, no moral equivalency here between, be, between the brutal violence of Hamas starting Saturday morning and the military response of Israel, what they must do to literally put down this violence. Israel is in crisis, and it's a crisis. Many of you are hearing these things unparalleled for 50 years. There have been skirmishes, there have been fights, there have been, have been challenges, but I, I even it was Netanyahu who, who first said that we haven't seen this much innocent life lost in Israel since, well, not even in Israel, but we haven't seen this much innocent life lost among the Jews since the Holocaust. We're, it's, the numbers right now are staggering, 1,200 Jewish people, innocent, we're not talking in warfare, we're talking about those who were slaughtered, 1,200 right now, and they still haven't recovered everyone. So it is awful, it is brutal, and something that I gotta add on top of that is it is absolutely shocking to see people giving into and even embracing this evil. As we're seeing in our own country, and as we're seeing in, in little spots around the world, we are witnessing what I would call a sickening combination of, of fear and foolishness and blindness. For anyone to align themselves, even at this point, to align themselves with Hamas and Palestinian terror is, is it's unconscionable. This fear and foolishness and blindness, I'm talking about on this side of the Atlantic. And there are some things that are being crystallized before our very eyes. Lines are being drawn, very clear lines between right and wrong, between God's way and that way and the way of hatred and the devil and evil. And people are gonna have to decide where they're gonna stand. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The desperately sick heart of humanity is on full display right now. I don't know if you, if you listened in, I, I had an appointment up in Bellingham earlier today and I was driving back and so I was listening to the radio and I listened to President Biden addressing this. And... Um, he was, he was talking about how, I think they asked him the question, how do, you, how do you deal with times like these? And by the way, that's where we're going tonight. We're gonna talk about how do you deal with times like these? And his answer was, my faith. And then he said that there is some goodness in all of us. And I'm thinking, Jeremiah 17, verse nine, the heart is desperately sick. 
I mean, that's what the Bible tells us, that there is at the heart of all of us the sin nature that must be put down. I, I shared with our staff earlier this morning, there's a little Gaza Strip in all of us. It's called the flesh. My sons were shocked. They were surprised when we looked at a map and talked about where the Gaza Strip is. And, and David and, and Chris both were saying, wait, you're telling me that it is in Israel? And I said, yeah, there it is. And it hit me at the time because they were so shocked by this. I went, you know, there's a little bit of Gaza Strip in us all. There's flesh that must be put down. There is an evil that wants to rise up. Sanctification, I mean, first thing Jesus does is offer us salvation by God's grace, but then he begins to work sanctification in our lives. And sanctification is the removal of the flesh. And it's, it's a lifelong process. I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself, but... It, it, it blows my mind that people are siding with Hamas right now. I'm not talking about other Palestinians. I'm talking about people around the world who are either celebrating it, as we saw happen in the streets of Iran, protesting against Israel on some college campuses in New York City and other places. I've been watching, and you have too, this cowardly equivocation, people kind of backing down and not, not even willing to name Hamas or not even willing to say, take a stand one side or the other. It's, it's absolute cowardice. Or people who are just silent. You know what? You, you, gotta, you gotta choose up sides. There is a right and there is a wrong here. And those who clamor in this world to, to see Israel disappear, they need to take a lesson from history. So let, let me help right now. Where are the Kenites? Where are the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites? Where have all the Hittites gone? Long time passing. Where are the Perizzites and the Rephaim and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites? Turn off your flashlights, you won't find them. They don't exist anymore. All of these major nations, all of these mighty people groups no longer exist. You can't find them. You know who you can find? Israel. An ancient people by all standards. A, a, a people that are still here, should not be here, should not exist as a nation. You can't find any of the other nations. Some say, well, okay, where was God, though? Where was God in this crisis? And my answer to you, and it's the same answer I would give any time you ask, where is God in a crisis? He is faithful. He's faithful. This is not what we're watching, as, as horrific as it is for the Jewish people. This is not ultimately about Israel. And it is not ultimately about Hamas. It's not about Iran. It's not about the Middle East. And it's not about you, and it's not about me. And any crisis, whether it's global or national or even personal, God is faithful to his word and to himself. And everything going on is swirling down to the final conclusion, and that is the glory of God over all things. He is righteous, he is just, he alone is God. And he's faithful to himself. I love the verse, Hebrews chapter six, verse 18 says, two un, by two unchangeable things, it is impossible for God to lie. He, he used two unchangeable things, and, and that is his name, himself, and his word. So he based his word on himself. He swore literally on himself. The Hebrew pastor says people will swear on someone greater or something greater than themselves to make a point. God swore on himself. And then he gave us his word, himself and his word, and it, it cannot not happen. All that God said must come to completion. That is why Israel still exists as a people and all those other nations do not. As a people, as a nation, we still see Israel here. God promised David a kingdom, and that kingdom is eternal in reach, and the devil has tried over and over and over and over again to destroy the promise of the kingdom. In 586 B.C., Babylon 
took the, the, the remnant then of, of the kingdom of Judah out. The kingdom of Israel had already been destroyed. And they took the Jews off into captivity in Babylon. 70 years later, by God's promise, they came right back. In 70 AD, Rome tried to decimate Israel. They remained. In 110, along comes Hadrian, and he tried to finally finish the whole thing. Actually, it's 135. Tried to finish the whole thing. And then for nearly 18, a little over 1,800 years, there were Jews in the land, but there was no nation of Israel, and there was no way a nation could just spring up in a day. (laughs) Right, Jake? There's no way this could happen, and yet Bible prophecy students knew that it would happen. I love reading commentaries from the 1800s before Israel became a nation in a day, as Isaiah uh, 66 proclaims. I love reading those commentaries and looking at faithful Bible students who who would make these statements about when Israel is back in the land, when there was no way Israel could be back in the land. God is faithful. God will see his promises through. Now, all that, because in 2 Samuel, chapters 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, all of this, the kingdom is in crisis. It's the first great crisis of the kingdom of David so far. It's remarkable to me that once again, here we are looking at writings that are 3,000 years old, studying a story 3,000 years old that's immediately relevant to what is happening this week in the world. The kingdom of Israel, the nation, the promise of God that must be fulfilled. And as chapter 16 opens, we're in the midst of this crisis. We've already been looking at it a bit. David has fled his beloved Zion, the city of David, Jerusalem. He, he, is, he is running for his life. So are those who are loyal to God and the kingdom. They are fleeing together. But this is still day one of David's flight. And we're not even gonna get through the whole flight and the fight tonight. I didn't mean for that to happen. We're not gonna get through all of that tonight. We're just gonna do chapter 16 because I wanna hone in on something here, take our time to think about what is going on, what is God doing in the midst of all this crisis. So as chapter 16 opens, David has now crested the Mount of Olives. If you were to leave the city of David and cross the Kedron Valley, you'd find yourself heading east, going up over the Mount of Olives. How many of you have walked down the Mount of Olives? Can I just see a show of hands? Okay, there's a number of you who have been there and you've taken the walk down that hill. That is a steep hill. Imagine walking up. And David is now up and over the top, and he's heading down the other side. If you continue to head down the other side, you end up straight out heading toward Jericho. Beyond Jericho, you arrive at the fords of the wilderness, the Jordan River. That's where they're headed. So he's up over the top of the Mount of Olives when we open it up. Absalom who is attacking the kingdom, attacking the kingdom of promise. He is the first to do so. He is usurping the kingdom. And note this throughout. God promised this to David. So it doesn't even matter what else is going on here. It doesn't even matter who thinks they should rule. God has promised it to David. That's the promise that is in play. But Absalom's on his way to Jerusalem. He's not quite in Jerusalem at this point. He's about to get there. He will be by the end of the chapter. He's headed that way. David is headed across and up and over the top of the Mount of Olives. Okay, verse one of 2 Samuel chapter 16. Now, when David had passed a little beyond the summit, behold, Ziba, you guys remember Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of saddled donkeys and on them 200 loaves of bread, a hundred clusters of raisins, a hundred summer fruits, and a jug of wine. And the king said to Ziba, why do you have these? Ziba said, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride, the bread and summer fruit are for the young men to eat, and the wine for whoever is faint in the wilderness to drink. So here comes Ziba rushing out to David. He's caught up to him now on the other side of the Mount of Olives. And he's got got Uber donkeys, DoorDash, and a nice liquid drug for the faint. So if you're taking notes tonight, donkeys, DoorDash, and drugs. Okay, this is what he shows up with. 
Before we deal with Ziba and this part of the story, I want you to turn in your Bibles just for a moment over to the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. Just over to the right a bit. For me, it's uh, page 676. (laughs) Proverbs 31. Verse four. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink. For they will drink and forget what is decreed and pervert the rights of all the afflicted. Give strong drink to him who is perishing and wine to him whose life is bitter. Ziba says, I brought wine for anyone who's faint in the wilderness. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his trouble no more. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all the unfortunate. Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy. This is as close as the Bible comes to prohibition. So if anyone's had the conversation about does the Bible, does does God prohibit alcohol? Does he prohibit drinking? And that's as close as you get. What the Bible does do, absolutely, the word calls for care, it calls for moderation, it calls for wisdom when it comes to wine and drinking that you understand the effect and the risk and what you're delving into and what you're dealing with. But right here we have this, it is not for kings to drink wine, O Lemuel. Well, who's King Lemuel? There was never a King Lemuel in Israel. Oh, yes, there was. And his real name was Solomon. And we believe that Lemuel literally is Solomon here. It's interesting, if you go back to verse one of chapter 31, uh, this is Proverbs, the words of King Lemuel, the oracle which his mother taught him, Lemuel Melech means a king for God. King Lemuel is a king for God. And this strong warning is given, and this is most likely Solomon who's writing it down, who learned it from his mother. Who's his mother? That's Sheba. That's very interesting to me. Now, I, you know, I could, should I go there? It's, it's interesting to me because I, I do wonder, I, I can't prove this at all, but I do wonder what part alcohol played in the affair, if any. Maybe not, but it's really interesting to me that the mother of Lemuel gives Lemuel these words, Lemuel being Solomon, Solomon now preaches these words, it is not for kings to drink and forget themselves. Is it possible that David, being in his bed all day long that day, rolled out of bed to a glass of wine and was stumbling about on the roof when he saw Bathsheba? I can't prove any of that, okay? This pure opinion, just surmise, just throwing it out there. But regardless There is a strong warning here for kings. We could say for rulers. We could, I think, even apply that to leaders. A strong warning. And the question that we need to ask is very simply, are we the perishing, the bitter, the impoverished of this world, or are we royalty? So the Bible says, 1 Peter 2, 9, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The Bible talks all the time about us walking in the light, talks about us living lives that are sober and alert and clear-headed. Why? For those who are afflicted, for the needy, that we won't forget, we won't pervert the rights of others because we will be clear thinking. Are we royalty? In Christ we are. Do we speak then for the mute? Do we defend the rights of the afflicted and the needy? If so, take care when it comes to wine or any kind of drinking. It's not for kings to do so. Verse three, back in chapter 16, so along comes Ziba and he has wine and it is interesting that the wine is for whoever is faint in the wilderness to drink, whoever just needs to be a little numb to the sorrow and the pain that is going on. And then in verse three, the king said, and where is your master's son? In other words, where's Mephibosheth? Where, I mean, you're his servant. You remember Mephibosheth, the, the, the son of, actually the grandson of Saul? 
son of Jonathan, who is crippled, who is unable even to walk, and his servant Ziba, and, and David blessed Mephibosheth with all of the holdings of his grandfather Saul, gave him all the land back, and set a, a nice place at his table, his royal table, for Mephibosheth to eat for the rest of his life? Where is your master's son? The king said, David says. And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he's staying in Jerusalem, for he said, today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. It's a lie. This is a lie. Second Samuel chapter nine, we saw David do this restoration of Mephibosheth. We saw this amazing grace, unusual, by the way, by international standards of the day, what the new incoming king would do is wipe out all the remnant of the old king. But David doesn't do that. He goes a different way. With Mephibosheth, he seeks to show kindness, kindness to the household of Saul and to his, his dearest best friend, Jonathan. And you read this, and if you hadn't gotten any farther in the scriptures, but you just heard Ziba say, he thinks Mephibosheth staying in Jerusalem to get the kingdom back, you'd think, oh, wow, what a jerk. This is how Mephibosheth repays David for his kindness? But Ziba is an opportunist. And he sees his opportunity and he is going for it. He has been crafting his own little conspiracy behind his master's back. And this is working now against Mephibosheth. But listen, David is not in a good position to make a wise decision. David's in crisis. Think about yourself when you're in crisis, when everything is spinning out of control. And right now, remember, he's, this, the first day isn't even over yet. The flight from Jerusalem has just begun. He's up to the top and over the Mount of Olives. He's exhausted, he's weary, he's careworn. He's heard that his, his great counselor friend, Ahithophel, has betrayed him. He's, he's just, mind's got to be spinning. And Ziba comes up and now tells him Mephibosheth has betrayed him as well. He is weak, he's no condition to be thinking something through. We need to learn from this so that, 2 Corinthians 2.11, no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. What do you mean? Satan will always kick you when you're down. Satan will always seek to discourage you, to demoralize me when I am least able to fight against it, when I'm worried, when I'm stressed, when I'm careworn. Isn't it amazing when life is not going well how you seem to keep getting hit by stuff? That's how the devil works. He wants to undermine. Think about this. How in the world, and this you won't even be able to be considered now for weeks if not months, how did the Mossad miss this Hamas buildup. The Mossad is Israel's CIA. It's their secret agent force. This is some, these are some of the most brilliant people in the world. This is one of the most cracked spy agencies globally, and they, for whatever reason, completely missed what Hamas was about to do. How is that possible? How did the IDF miss it? And I'm just gonna give you kind of Rick's thought on this. My suspicion, they were also focused on cultural division, political infighting, and judicial strife, and they were distracted from the real enemy. This is why God hates strife so much. It distracts us from the real enemy. And the people of Israel have been really, I mean, over the last couple of years especially, it's been chaotic in government, how many elections have they gone through and, and now trying to bring about this judicial reform and the protesting in the streets and the, and the division has never been greater inside the country. Well, I would say until today, I think the unity has just been restored because I think once again, the Jewish people recognize this existential threat that has always been there for them and they have now come back together I am not saying this to blame Israel in the least. This is not Israel's fault, but I'm saying that this tends to be when the enemy attacks and also when self-seekers show up. Internal struggles will always take your eye off the ball. Well, we've seen it happen here in church. 
when there have been internal struggles at the bridge, suddenly the gospel seems to get quieter. The reason that we gather seems to take a backseat to the problem at hand that is so important and only later do we look back and go, that was really stupid. While it suited Ziba, he remained in league with Mephibosheth. I mean, this blessed him. He got to, you know, he cared for Mephibosheth, so no doubt he got at least the scraps from the king's table. I mean, he's involved and, and life is pretty good. But now David's fleeing. Now Absalom is coming in. Now things don't look good, and so Ziba has to think, what am I gonna do? I gotta figure this one out. And so in this moment of convenience, what Ziba does is he usurps Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is stuck back in Jerusalem. He can't get out. What's he gonna do, walk out? And we'll find out later, Mephibosheth was trying to secure for himself a donkey. We don't know the whole story, but I suspect that Ziba just never got the donkey for him. Instead, he just took off. Took the donkeys with him up over the hill to give to King David to make his play, and he is playing a weary, stressed David, so verse four, the king said to Ziba, behold, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. It worked. Mephibosheth just got everything, the inheritance, the land, it's all now. Why? Because David can't deal with this. He can't think about it. Okay, just and Ziba said, I prostrate myself. Let me find favor in your sight, O oh, my Lord, the king. David just spoke with his royal authority and handed everything that he had given Mephibosheth over to Ziba. It is an immediate response, and you know what? It's not thought through. David acts right here. This is rash and emotional. I don't blame him. Like I said, if I was in David's sandals, I don't know that I would do anything different. It's just, okay, whatever, that's fine. I got other things on my mind here. I'm stressed, I'm worried. The kingdom is falling apart. Jerusalem is in danger of my own son. So I, I get where he's coming from. But it's rash. Proverbs 18, 13. Note this, a couple of verses. Proverbs 18, 13 he who gives an answer before he hears, it is folly and shame to him. That, that means before you think it through, before you take the time to process what you've been asked, answering too quickly is foolish. Proverbs 18, 17, so a little further down in the same chapter, the first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines him. And David will come face to face with Mephibosheth again, and we'll see the end of that story later on. Bottom line, times of crisis are poor times to judge, poor times to make decisions, especially quick decisions that will affect other people. Best thing you can do in times of crisis is, whoa, slow down, slow down. Don't give immediate answer, pray about it. Wait on the Lord. Proverbs 24, 15, do not lie in wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not destroy his rest, resting place. For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in time of calamity. And, and that's the deal. And, and I'm telling you what we're gonna see happen to Hamas. This is a hand that is way overplayed. The wicked stumble in time of calamity. They brought the calamity and they're going to stumble in this calamity and there may be a lot of bloodshed along the way. But this is what happens to the wicked. Don't go the way of the wicked. Go the way of the wise. Listen to this, James chapter three, verse 13. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior, his deeds in the gentleness of of wisdom. Gentleness is not rash. Gentleness is never rushed or hurried. It says if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly and natural and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there's disorder and every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure. 
and then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's the time to make judgments, times of peace. When things have settled down, that's when to give answer. My wife and my kids know that the first answer my tendency is to give at home is no. So, you know, and, and Cheryl knows me so well. I've even heard her say, go ask your dad. He's gonna say no, but just give it some time. <laughs> He'll come around. But it's just don't ask, I gotta think about it. I gotta process. That's kind of what I do, I process. But to wait and to pray and to come to that place of peace and quiet and rest, rather than being in, in flight or, or crisis mode, which is where we find David. I know I'm sitting on this for a little bit, but I'll tell you what, David would have been so much better off, so would Mephibosheth, by the way, if David had just said, let me think about this and continued on and not just handed everything over to this Ziba character. By the way, Ziba's name, Ziba means convenient alliance. A convenient alliance. Now, I, I wanna share something. This is a real quick side note for your Bible students. There's a really cool website called Abarim, A-B-A-R-I-M, abarim.com, and it's all Hebrew names and biblical names. And, and they go through and explain the meaning. And sometimes the meaning is not the same, like if you look in a, in a, a Bible dictionary or, or a commentary or like Strong's Concordance, it may be a little different, but what they do is track the name down through time to what it means to the Jewish people. So according to abarim.com, Ziba, Ziba, if you look in a Bible dictionary, will, will mean statue or plant. But in its context and its meaning as a name for a person, it bears the meaning convenient alliance. And, and that's Ziba, he's a man of convenient alliance. You know, allied to Mephibosheth until it looked like that wasn't gonna get him what he wanted, so he changes his alliance and shifts to King David. Do you remember another man of convenient alliance whose name was Judas? Who as long as it looked like there was some potential royalty in Jesus, Judas was with him. Pilfering the money bag, stealing from him, but he was still there, you know? Until he began to realize this was all about to fall apart and then he decided I gotta get out what I can and he betrayed Jesus. Well, back to David. David is reacting. He is reacting rather than pausing and reflecting and even praying about it. One of the best verses in the Bible, you know it well, Isaiah 40, verse 30, though youths grow tired and weary and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. And that promises even for young men, David at this time is about 67. Verse five. When David came, King David came to Bacharim, real quickly, Bacharim is a village over the very steep Mount of Olives, down the other side, if you keep going and you head east between Jerusalem and Jericho is this village of, or was this village of Bachurim. So that's, that's where he is at this point. He's down uh, past Bethany on the, the other side, the east side of the Mount of Olives, and he's at Bachurim. Behold, there came out from there a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, and he came out cursing continually as he came. You ever know someone who just curses continually? I just, I don't get these people. Somebody give them 30 days to a better vocabulary, okay? So he comes out cursing. He threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were at his right hand and at his left. Then, or thus Shemi said when he cursed, get out, get out, you man of bloodshed, you worthless fellow, or literally you man of Belial, the Lord has returned upon you all the bloodshed of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. And behold, you are taken in your own evil, for you are a man of bloodshed. 
he says all this as he's throwing rocks and breathing out curses on David. You know, what's interesting about this story is this guy had to be a really bad shot because he doesn't hit anybody. He's just chucking stones right and left, you know, whoo, whoo, whoo. but he doesn't hit David. He doesn't hit any, anyone else. Shemi, it's a common Hebrew name. It means renowned, but he is not living up to his name. This guy is throwing shade. He's throwing stones. And you know, think about this. People actually can throw stones like this far more accurately today. The stones come right through the phones. And there is this, this kind of new opening in sin in our world today of, of slander and of cursing that is so easy to do because people can hide behind little 5.8 by 2.8 inch screens and shoot off all kinds of fiery darts. This, by the way, that's why I got off Facebook for the second time. I got off it before and I thought, well, you know, there's some value to it and some people I can be, and I got back on it and I just got, I got sick and tired of people giving their opinions, but in the midst of their opinions, firing off, throwing stones at other people. It's, it's all over social media. It's a real problem. And I tell you this because remember, we are not ignorant of Satan's schemes. And so this stone throwing, cursing man comes rushing out on David. And these words, his words are no doubt demonically designed to dig at David's conscience. I mean, what is David thinking as he's fleeing Jerusalem? Maybe this is my fault. Maybe I deserve this. I mean, after what I pulled, God gives me a kingdom and then I do what I did. And my house is a mess and my own son is against me. Maybe, maybe this is just the punishment I deserve it's that tendency toward woe is me thinking when life's not going well for us. And so he's, this guy, he's even using the Lord. Notice this verse eight. The Lord has returned upon you all the bloodshed. The Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. Is this guy a prophet? Listen, if it's the Lord who's done this, then the Lord would have to be revoking his own unconditional promise to David. And the gifts and the calling of God, Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, are irrevocable. Something I have this conversation with people from time to time. Don't misunderstand this covenant. The covenant of David is unconditional. It is not based on David. It's not based on David's faithfulness. It's not based on David's goodness or righteousness. It's not based on David being a man after God's own heart. This is God's promise of what God is going to do. This kingdom must come. And it can't be shaken. Though the son of the king try to usurp the throne and the king is fleeing for his life, the kingdom can't be shaken. Though 586 BC and 70 AD happened, though what we're watching right now is happening in Israel, the kingdom is coming and it cannot be shaken. God's promises are irrevocable. And this guy is saying, thus saith the Lord, beware the false prophet. That's the position this Shemi is taking right now. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 16, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorns or figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit. The bad tree bears bad fruit. A tree cannot produce, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their fruits. So here's this fruit coming out, cursing the king and throwing stones. You know where he's coming from. Guy's got issues. There's some bad fruit going on here. This is another attack of the enemy. The false prophet will always tear down, will unsettle, will discourage now, tearing down and discouraging is kind of easy to, to figure out after a bit of time, but it's the unsettling part that, that, that's hard to follow. The false prophet is gonna unsettle you. Uh, be aware of that. Be alert to that because false prophecy is in play in this world. The godly prophet here in the age of grace is gonna do something different. Speaking out the word of God, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, says the godly prophet, this is the one who speaks to men for edification, exhortation, and consolation or comfort. 
You know it's a word of the Lord when it is edifying and exhorting and comforting. Well, this guy's clearly not because with every curse is coming a stone. (laughs) Still not hitting anybody. Verse nine, then Abishai, the son of Zeruah, said to the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over now and cut off his head. (laughs) I gotta confess. I'd be like, yeah, let's go. Come on, I'll back you up. I'm, man, Abishai is a man of action. I'm with you, Abishai. This is the same nephew who stood with David over a sleeping King Saul in 1 Samuel 26. Do you remember the story? He stood there and he goes, let me pin him to the ground while he sleeps. I'll just spear him to the ground right here now. Let, let me be the one to do this. Now, I would be there. I, I mean, this, this is... Should I even confess this to you all? Maybe I shouldn't. You know, when I see what Hamas has done, there is a part of me that says, put them down. I mean, I want the evil, the evil needs to be put down, but it's just, it's so easy to side with, with, you know, the righteous anger of an Abishai here. They're throwing stones at David for crying out loud, let's cut off this guy's head. Let's cancel this clown right now. And is Abishai justified? Is he justified in killing this Shemi, this stone-throwing idiot? Exodus twenty two twenty eight 28 says, you shall not curse God nor curse a ruler of your people. Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20, furthermore, in your bedchamber, do not curse a king. I'd love to retranslate that pastor, but I can't, it's just king. <laughs> And in your sleeping rooms, do not curse a rich man, for a bird of the heavens will carry the sound and the winged creature will make the matter known. That's interesting. Twitter makes it known today. So the bird or Twitter, whatever, you know. Twitter, what do we even call Twitter? X? It's called X? So do you send out a, a what? An X? And what? I don't know, okay, it doesn't matter. I'm not on Twitter, so I don't really care. But this is yet another temptation coming at David. David who is weary, David who is stressed, who is in the middle of this great crisis, and now the temptation is, kill this guy. What's the heart of God? I like the fact that we see the ups and downs of David, and we do say you make that rash decision with Ziba, but here, we're gonna see that that heart of God in David again. The heart of God is not, is not to hit back or make him pay. Now listen carefully to me. Because there's evil in the world and there is a righteous and sometimes violent response to that evil. But to you and to me as followers of Jesus Christ, be very clear on this. Matthew 5, 43, Jesus said, you have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The sun shines and the rain falls in Gaza. Oh, so So Pastor Rick, what are you saying? Israel should just roll over? No, I'm not. We're talking apples and oranges here. And the oranges tonight for us as followers of Jesus Christ is that when someone comes against us like a shami, someone curses you, someone's throwing stones at you, someone's coming after you, your response is to pray for them and to love them. Let me give you four quickly before we're done tonight, four critical points in this verbal attack. Four ways of dealing with criticizing stone throwers like Shami. Number one, listen up. Listen up. In verse 10, the king said, <laughs> responding to Abishai, Why have or what have I to do with you, O sons of Zeruiah? Sons of Zeruiah, that's his sister, so Abishai is his nephew. The other nephew who is there, present, he's not named right here, but David says, sons of Zeruiah, so it's gotta be both of them are saying, let's go kill this guy, Abishai and Joab, okay? What do I have to do with you guys, he says. If he curses, and if the Lord has told him curse David, 
then who shall say, why have you done so? Wow, this is an amazing response. David says, if this is from the Lord, who can challenge it? If God has told him to come against me, I'm not gonna speak a word against this. This is, this is once again, David functioning in the spirit. This is the man after God's own heart. David's evaluation of this rock-throwing critic, his evaluation is centered on the Lord. Listen up. Listen up. If you are being criticized, if you are being slandered, if you're being gossiped about, the first thing to do before you even enter into defense mode is listen up. Lord, is there something I need to hear in this? Is there something that I'm missing in this? God is not going to speak in a false prophetic dressing down, but the Holy Spirit can very easily retranslate criticism to conviction. Criticism to conviction. So you may be being criticized. I, I tell you that this is something that I do. If, if I get criticism, I don't get a ton, I get some. I mean, you do too, we all get it, right? But if I get a criticism, if I get an email sent to me or something, uh, the first thing I'll do is I will read through it. And typically my flesh will go, <laughs> but I'll pray about it. And especially if it's, if it's related to our fellowship. I, I'll stop and I'll go, okay, Lord, a, am I missing something? Sometimes I'll pull some other people in there. I'll say, Jake, come here, come here. Is this, is this accurate? Is this what you see? You know, and, and he, he always says, well, of course not, boss. You're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's wisdom. I'll say, Les, do you, do you see this going on here? Am I, am I making a bad judgment? Because I'm totally capable of that. Um, and, and, then, and then typically I'll crumple it up if it's a letter and I'll just throw it away. No, I, but I'll, I will think it through. Listen up, listen up. Start with the Lord. Lord, is this you? Is this criticism something that's come that I need to hear? Don't just dismiss it outright. Verse 11, then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, behold, my son who came out from me seeks my life. How much more now this Benjamite, I mean, he's almost cutting him some slack. Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him. Now, David is not in that moment absolutely sure that this is from the Lord. But he's still in that place of saying, you know what, I'm not, if, 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 from what I've done, I deserve more than rocks and curses. So if this is from the Lord, let it play. Listen up. Secondly, look honestly. Look honestly. Try to step back from emotion and honestly evaluate the situation. David does not justify this behavior, but what he does is show amazing insight and compassion. Insight and compassion. He had insight into his own failure. So this is how David is looking honestly. Hey, my own son wants me dead. This guy's cursing me. But my son right now is heading into Jerusalem and, and, and wants to see me killed and wants to take my kingdom. This is amazing. David is king of Israel and he doesn't shy away from the truth. He's honest with all those within earshot. Look, my family's a mess. This is the way it is. He, he, he is showing amazing insight. By the way, forgiveness allows you to do that. The fact that David walks in the forgiveness of God over the whole Bathsheba incident, he knows he's forgiven by the Lord. He can be open and honest with others. Yeah, I blew it. I blew it. You know, someone wants to bring up some sin in your life. Yeah, yeah, I did that. I am forgiven. Praise God. Thank the Lord. But yeah, I did that. We see this insight with David looking honestly at the situation, but then we see compassion when he says, how much more this Benjamite? I mean, David actually understands Shemi happens to be right now on the other side of the aisle. He's actually showing a bit of understanding. This guy is obviously opposed to me. He is for the new administration and not for my administration. But you know what? That's where he's at. Compassion and insight. And I think you know this, but listen, someone's sin against me is never justification for me to sin against them. 
So we see David listening up. We see him looking honestly. Ephesians chapter four, verse 26 tells us, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And again, do not give the devil an opportunity, which I hope you see is the underlying lesson here. Satan is always looking for opportunity. Don't give it to him. There's a great benefit in reading the situation, looking up and asking the Lord about it, and then listening, look, listening up and, and looking honestly at the situation, trying to understand. In fact, one of the best things you can do when you're criticized, try to get into the shoes of the critic. Try to understand where are they coming from? It's amazing how often you'll find when you do that, that when you're standing in their shoes, what's really coming at you is their own hurt or their own brokenness or their own sense of lostness. Shimei obviously is very emotional. Maybe he was extremely attached to Saul and the kingdom of Saul. We don't know the backstory. But David says, hey, this guy's a Benjamite. He is of the tribe of Saul. I'm not surprised if he's upset. Number three, so, so again, listen up. Number two, look honestly. Number three, leave it to the Lord. Leave it to the Lord, verse 12. David says, perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of cursing this day. That is faith. God's got this. And though I'm being cursed right now and stone's thrown, God has this. Proverbs 16, verse seven tells us, when a man's ways are pleasing to the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. You know what's gonna happen? I gotta tell you ahead of time, Shemi's gonna come back and repent and apologize when David comes back into Jerusalem. Would he be repenting and apologizing if Abishai had cut his head off? Probably not. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing how in this stinging rebuke, David is pressing in to the Lord. He's leaving the, the outcome to the Lord. And every criticism that, that comes your way, that comes my way, is a good opportunity from Jesus. Look at it that way. He said in Matthew 5, 11, blessed are you when, when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad for your reward in heaven is great for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And we know, Romans 8, 28, that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Verse 13, so David and his men went on their way and Shimei went along on the hillside parallel with him. As he went, he cursed and cast stones and threw dust at him. Well, that's gonna be damaging, isn't it? I mean, what, he run out of stones? Listen, I've been to Israel a few times. You don't run out of stones. No, no. But he's throwing dust. What's that all about? He's saying, this is Hebrew euphemism, I wish you were dead and buried. He's throwing dust as if to cover David with dust, as in the dust of death. Again, we're gonna see this whole thing play out in biblical time. Uh, I think a week from Sunday, we're gonna come back and look at more of this. But with Shami, this guy has obviously a bitterness about him. He's obviously very upset. And, and here's a phrase I'm gonna speak to you now, and I'll speak it again a week from Sunday. A bitter root produces deadly fruit. A bitter root produces deadly fruit. Hebrews 12, 15 says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. Ephesians 4, 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. See, here's the, here's the difference. I said there's no moral equivalency between Hamas and Israel right now. The difference is Hamas is all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander. That's Hamas. Israel's response is a response in defense of their butchered people. These are different things. But as followers of Jesus, we are told, Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Pastor Rick, how many times are you gonna read Ephesians 4.32 to us? 
as many times as we need to until we all get it, starting right here. What does that forgiveness look like? And just as God in Christ has also forgiven you, this is exactly what it looks like. Think about this. As David goes up the Mount of Olives, so Jesus was taken out to Calvary. 1 Peter 2.23, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. David, in this story, just here in chapter 16, we see such a type of Jesus in how he responds to this cursing Shemi. A type of Jesus in verbal abuse by entrusting himself to the Lord. David seems to know this. We've talked about this, said it last week. You can shake a king, but you cannot shake the kingdom. God's got this. God's got a will here. Verse 14, then the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary and he refreshed himself there. There where? Well, he said before, I'm going to the fords of the wilderness. I'm going out to the Jordan. So what David's gonna do, we'll find out more about this in the story to come. David and the people go all the way out to the banks, the West Bank, ironically, the West Bank of the Jordan River. They're out there and they're gonna kind of put up camp there and wait to see what's going to happen with Absalom and Jerusalem. Now a warning is gonna come and David and everyone's gonna have to move across the Jordan to the other side just for self-protection. That's, that's uh, in a coming part of the story. But what David does here, verse 14, we just gotta add this last little bit in. The king and all the people who were with him arrived weary and he refreshed himself there. Listen up, look honestly, leave it to the Lord and number four, let it be. Let it be. Those are words of wisdom. (laughs) Let it be. David, listen, David moved on. But the shade and the stones are behind him. He just kept going. Guys cursing at him, David kept going. He finally comes to the fords of the wilderness, to the Jordan River, and he now is refreshed. Great words of Jesus. Mark chapter six, verse 11. Any place that does not receive you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet for a testimony against them. Someone throwing dust at you? Someone throwing shade? Let it be. You just move on. You, You know, vengeance is mine, thus says the Lord. You let the Lord deal with that and you keep going. Don't carry burdens that are not yours to bear. And I, I'm telling you, this, this is one thing, if I've learned anything in ministry, this is one of the big ones. Mileage has taught me, if I, if I sit there and seethe in my own bitterness over the criticism of someone else, I will never continue. You've gotta let it be. Take what you know is from the Lord, learn from the Lord, show compassion and understanding for the other person, find out what is truly yours to, to hear in this, and then move on, just move on. David comes to the, to the Jordan. He refreshed himself there. Are you tonight, is anyone here tonight worn out from a verbal stone throwing? So I don't know, but I'm guessing in a, in a gathering of this size, someone has taken it on the chin recently. Maybe it was on Facebook and you just can't shake that post. Man, I just want to delete it, you know? Unfriend! <laughs> and it's amazing, you can unfriend, but it's still in your brain, isn't it? And you're still going, man, it just ticks me off. Is there a Shemi in your life right now? Maybe a coworker or a boss or someone in your life who just keeps this negativity going. Listen to me. Do you wanna be refreshed? Rest in the Lord. Psalm 37, verse seven. David wrote this, and we think David may have written it at, as part of a, of a flurry of psalms that he wrote at this time. Psalm 37, verse seven. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Rest in the Lord. Jesus said, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Mentally striving, upset, criticized, 
come to Jesus. The, the, the thing that's so marvelous about, about walking in the Lord and knowing that the Holy Spirit is immediately present is you can come to Jesus anywhere, anytime, immediately, wherever you are. Come to Jesus. You don't even have to travel out to the Jordan. Just come to Jesus. Well, verse 15. Then Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, entered Jerusalem and Ahithophel with him. Came about when Hushai the Archite, David's friend, do you remember Hushai came to David in the last chapter? And David said, Don't come with me. You go back and you be my spy. So Hushai is like the original Mossad. And when Hushai, the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, that Hushai said to Absalom, long live the king, long live the king. Now, I want you to pay really close attention to Hushai's words here. Listen to his words, and you will see his loyalty. He's, he's very careful in the words that he speaks. But watch this. Long live the king. He doesn't say which king, right? Absalom said to Hushai, is this your loyalty to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? And Hushai said to Absalom, no, for whom the Lord, this people, and all the men of Israel have chosen, his I will be, and with him I will remain. <laughs> this is still easily David that he's talking about. But he's carefully choosing his words. And Hushai, uh, and then uh, besides he says, whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son? Which son? Doesn't say. As I have served in your father's presence, so I will be in your presence. He doesn't say, so I'm gonna serve you as my king. He says, as I served him, well, I'll be here. <laughs> I love this. And then Absalom said to Ahithophel, give your advice, what shall we do? So Hushai's in. And Absalom doesn't even say anything else to him. He's just like, okay. And he turns to Ahithophel and begins to seek advice there. You know what, listen, when you enter into betrayal, it's really, really hard to know who you can trust. And this is Absalom's problem here. He is now betraying David. He is betraying the kingdom. Who can he trust? You start playing games like that with people and it is very hard to know who is really with you and who is against you when you have set yourself against other people. So Absalom kind of suspects him but he, he can't know, he can't know. Bible says, Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sin will find you out. And Absalom's betrayal will find him out. Um, what about Absalom's disloyalty, by the way? I mean, isn't it interesting how he says to Hushai, why aren't you out with your friend? Why didn't you go? Are you gonna be disloyal to him? You're his son, dude. Talk about disloyalty. It is so easy to miss our own sin in other people and then to judge them for it. And that's what Absalom is doing. Verse 21, so Ahithophel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house, and then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself odious to your father. The hands of all who are with you will also be strengthened so they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. That's exactly what you think it means. He went in and he slept with the concubines that belonged to his father, David. And this is immediate and direct fulfillment of God's prophetic word from Natan, from the Lord through Natan in chapter 12, verse 11. Let me read this to you again. Behold, thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them, into your, give them to your companion and he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did this secretly. I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun and by the way, on the roof, the same roof that David saw Bathsheba from. Now on this roof, of, uh, roof of, of David's adulterous lust, the, the tent is put up and all Israel walking by the palace can look up and go, <laughs> Absalom's in there with David's wives. We know who the boss is now. This is, by the way, is a cultural thing. Totally a cultural thing. You showed your authority. You showed your usurping power. You showed yourself to be the new ruler by taking the wives of the old ruler. 
And that's what he's done now. And, and this was Ahitophel's counsel. It is shocking counsel. But here up on the same roof that David lusted from, this prophecy is coming to pass. Some might say, yeah, well, what goes around comes around. Listen to me, it's not karma. It is not coincidence, it is consequence. And it was declared by the Lord himself. Verse 23, the advice of Ahitophel, which he gave in those days, was as if one inquired the word of God. See, this is how people viewed Ahithophel and his wisdom. This guy speaks, God's speaking. This guy speaks, it's the wisdom of heaven. This guy, wow, if Ahithophel says do it, this is what we need to do. I mean, there was such faith in this guy. He had such a reputation, and so was all the advice of Ahithophel regarded both by David and Absalom. So remember, Dave, this was his trusted counselor, his wise man of wise men. And this was Ahithophel's advice. How can this wise counselor be so ungodly in his counsel? And we're gonna talk about that a week from Sunday. But as we leave David in flight, um, I'm gonna just end with something else and I want you to think about this with me and then we'll be done. How many of you have thought, I just wish I could be a godly person? You don't have to raise your hand. I'm assuming most, if not all of you, at some point have thought, I would, I, I would love to be, I'd love to be like, like a Paul, you know? I, I'd love to be like a Sarah. I would love to be like, uh, you know, like John, the Baptist or the apostle, either one, both amazing. I would love to be a Peter. Actually, I'm kind of like Peter in a lot of ways, but I'd love to be Peter on a good day. <laughs> I would love to be more godly. I'm so tired of sin and the flesh, and I just wish I could be godly like, like the people of the Bible. And I remember thinking that. Not that I don't desire to be godly, but I remember thinking as, as a young man, I long for the day when I finally can stand up and say, I'm a godly man. You guys know where I'm going. Late in David's life, he is still on the path to godliness. Again, at 67 or 68 years of age, he's climbing the Mount of Olives, everything falling apart. He's still making not the wisest decisions in one case, but then very godly decisions and behavior in another case, and we see him still in the turmoil. It's like Paul saying, wretched man that I am. Sometimes I do good, sometimes I do evil. I wanna do good, but I do evil instead. And when I don't wanna do evil, I do evil instead of doing good. And Paul's just like, you know, who's gonna save me? Who will deliver me from this body of death? Romans chapter seven. This is the deal. The path to godliness is a long walk. Godliness takes struggle. David's life is the picture of a man learning to become godly. And he's not godly till he takes his last breath. And neither will you be, whether your last breath is in death or your last breath is right before we get caught up. Your godliness will be realized in the day of Christ Jesus. Until then, God is perfecting us, and that's the deal. And until then, you've got a choice. You can continue to fight Gaza in your life. Fight the flesh. It's always there. It is always there. It's not going away. Fight the flesh. Stand against the flesh. Guard against the flesh. Be sober. Be alert. Be aware of the flesh. And know that God is at work in you to make you Godly. It's, while he already sees you as holy. See, this is the mind-boggling thing to me about following Jesus. He already sees me as holy. God already sees me as righteous. I mean, that's almost laughable on certain days. But he sees righteous Rick. And yet he is also sanctifying me and perfecting me and perfecting you. It's a long walk up a long hill. This is life. And Israel as a nation is a picture of this because Israel is still deep in the struggle of the flesh, still struggling to become ultimately the people of God, still very 
focused on self, not having seen Messiah. That's the difference. When you see Messiah, then you begin to really be changed, and Israel will. Turning your Bibles to Zechariah 13, we're gonna end there. I just wanna show you one final thing here. Zechariah chapter 13 in your Bibles, the very end there of, your, uh, of the Hebrew scriptures, right before the Italian prophet, Malachi. Ah. Zechariah 13, now just listen and, and we'll be done. Verse one, in that day a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. What does that mean? That means day is coming when all Israel, Romans 11 tells us, will be saved. Day is coming when a fount will be opened and the sin that yet remains of the rebellion of Israel in not accepting Messiah will be washed away. They will see, in fact, Revelation, or Zechariah 12 and 13 talk about this. They will look on him whom they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They will recognize in Jesus their Messiah. In that day, a fount is going to be opened for the house of of David for Jerusalem for sin and for impurity. But skip down to verse seven. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd. That's Messiah, that's Jesus. Against the man my associate, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. Why? Because they're scattering in rebellion. Verse eight. And it will come about in all the land, declares the Lord, that two parts in it will be cut off and perish. But the third will be left in it. And this is difficult to read, but the tragic horror that we're seeing that has taken place in Israel right now will pale in comparison. That what pro This is not what God wants to have happen nor is it what any of us want to have happen in Israel. It's what God has seen. That two-thirds in the land, and I believe this is speaking of that time of tribulation, will, will perish, will be wiped out. One-third of the people will be left. When Paul says in Romans 11, and so all Israel will be saved, that's who he's talking about, I believe. That one-third it's all Israel that's left. When that, on that day, a fount is open in Jerusalem for sin and impurity, and all the remaining remnant of Israel will look up, will see Jesus, will be saved. As a nation, for the first time, all Israel will be saved. But listen to verse nine, and maybe make a little application to self. I will bring the third part through the fire. Refine them as silver is refined. Test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is my God. Refresh yourself in the Lord because we may yet have a little ways to go. And Father, I pray for any of my brothers and sisters tonight who are right now having stones thrown at them or are in a time of crisis who are facing their own life difficulties. And I pray that there would be comfort, the comfort of your Holy Spirit. I pray for a rest that will come of simply speaking the name of Jesus. I pray, Father, for godly wisdom from above to help navigate through these seasons of difficulty. I pray for strength, Lord, to be given us as your people as we await, long for the day of Christ Jesus. But your word tells us we have a need of endurance. So I pray for endurance as well. An endurance to wait for you, to call or bring us home however you have planned to do so, whenever you have planned to do so. Give us endurance to that day and sanctify us along the way, Lord. May we be more like Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.